to today's meeting, the topic of which is connected with HR and English for HR. So you will have the possibility to spend with me probably one hour, assuming it's going to be, of course, interesting and valuable for, for you. Uh, my name is Emilia and I will have a pleasure to run today's webinar, which is dedicated to main topics connected, I believe, with the challenges of HR. So my plan for today is in fact to combine on one hand typical vocabulary and phrases constructions related to English that can be applied for the purpose of HR, but on the other hand, I want this uh, webinar to be really valuable for you and interesting, which means that we will talk about the typical challenges of HR, uh, and for that purpose, I decided to choose two of them. So, first challenge probably is connected with the well-being initiatives, which is strictly connected with the last few years, quite intense time, the time of pandemic, the time of war, which can be, of course, challenging for any of us for HR, for people, for employees, for the bots. So I thought that it can be definitely the valuable topic for today. And apart from that, I was thinking also about the talent management, which is also one of the most challenging or even the most uh, challenging topic, especially from the point of view of the bots of the companies. So we are going to concentrate today on that two topics. In the meantime, of course, I will be using, using typical um, vocabulary that can be applied in terms of HR, in terms of practice as well, of course. Uh, I guess I owe you also a little bit of introduction of myself. As you already know, my name is Emilia and my professional career is strictly dedicated to human resources because I have been working in that area for the last uh, 15 years. I've been always responsible for everything what is connected with the um, administration, with all the kind of the soft topics connected, for example, with the recruitment, onboarding, designing the career paths, succession planning programs, offboarding and all different kind of topics connected with HR. Uh, I have been working not only in Poland, but also in different kind of countries. Among the others, I worked also in the USA, in China, in India. Currently, I'm located in Ireland. So um, I hope that I can also share this uh, HR English from the point of view of my practical experience. Uh, apart from the fact that my heart really belongs to human resources, uh, the other things which I'm responsible for running also my own business are correlated with running different kind of business trainings and also different kind of business English courses, which are always related to my practical expertise. Because I believe that if I want to do something what is really beneficial and valuable for the other people, it has to be connected with being able to share my practical expertise. That's why I run the courses like English for HR, for recruiters, uh, for customer service and different other ones. That's something from the point of view of presentation. Uh, before I move to the first challenge, which I wanted to mention, of course, if in the meantime you're going to have any kind of questions, some kind of the comments, please place them. But if it is about my answers, my relation to them, I will do it at the very end of the meeting. So we will have that time dedicated probably five minutes to Q&A. But of course, if it happens that in the meantime, some kind of question is going to emerge, just place it and I will manage them at the end of our today's meeting. And as I told you, I wanted to mention today two typical challenges that I believe that SHR we are right now facing, probably by right now, I should say for the last uh, three years. And I wanted to relate to the well-being, but also um, thinking here a little bit more about the background of the well-being. Because if we have a look at different kind of research, which were done by various companies, either in Poland or also in the other countries, probably we can see that kind of a trend, <clears throat> sorry, which shows that lately, if it is, for example, about the engagement of the employees, it is unfortunately dropping. For many, many years, not only in Poland, but also in Europe and generally worldwide, the engagement of the employees, it was really steadily rising. It was connected with also different kind of approach to managing people. So for many years, it was on the level of around 20%. But unfortunately, when the pandemic started, I believe that people started redesigning a little bit their values, their approach, and the approach also 
to work-life balance, or I should probably rather say life-work balance. So it all resulted, unfortunately, in the decreased engagement of the employees. And if it is about the latest results shared by Gallup done, in fact, last year, we can see right now that if it is, for example, about the Polish market, right now the engagement of the employees is on the level, or level of 14%, exactly the same as it works right now in Europe. So quite low, we're one of the last countries, unfortunately, if it is about the engagement. You can see even in the presentation that I gave there the comparison with Romania, which has the highest engagement rate if it is about the whole European countries. So Romania has 33%, again, in comparison to Poland with 14%. That is, in my opinion, quite interesting, especially from the point of view of our tiredness, of burnout, because a lot of people are suffering right now from burnout. A lot of people are suffering right now from various types of psychological mental disorders. And it is one of the reasons, in my opinion, of course, why unfortunately the engagement is dropping. So not only the global situation, the pandemic, the war, the inflation, so difficult, I would say, economic, social situation, but also the fact that we are just so tired, so exploited, exhausted. We are suffering from the chronic stress, I would say, and different kinds of disorders that unfortunately, they also impact the level of our engagement. And one of the reasons, in my opinion, of course, because it is probably just like a subjective opinion, is the fact connected with our working time. Because if you have a look at the details shared by the Eurostat, you can see that if it is about Poland, we are on the third place in the European Union if it is about the highest level of the working time. There is Greece, Romania and Poland. And if it is about Poland, for many, many years, we were really quite high in that rates, which means that all the time we're really working a lot. We are really working hard. We are working overtime. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why, unfortunately, again, our engagement and at the same time effectiveness is dropping. I would say that if it is from about Romania, it's a little bit different because they are also quite high. But at the same time, uh, if it is about the number of years, I would even say, from which we are working so hard, definitely, first of all, we enter the European, European Union much quicker, maybe not much quicker, but few years quicker. Uh, we started working in um, global companies a little bit earlier. So I would say that we have been working so much for the last at least 20 years. So it's even about having the right to be exhausted. That's why this is, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges for HR, that on one hand, we have the employees who are simply tired. You can even see the results of one of the Polish research showing that eight out of 10 Polish employees, they are reporting tiredness. So huge challenge for HR departments connected with the fact that we have the employees who are not so much engaged, who are quite tired, who are suffering from different kind of mental disorders. And on the other hand, we know that if we have people who are not engaged, it will immediately and directly impact their effectiveness. So probably if it is about that second side of the business, so if it is about the board, if it is about the top management, they can rather see that unfortunately the revenue is lower, the profit is lower, the turnover of the company is lower, so they think mm, there is something wrong because HR is coming to us, they want us to invest a lot in different kind of initiatives and on the other hand we can see that employees, they are not so dedicated anymore, they are not so engaged, they are not so effective because we can see unfortunately lower results. And that's why I would say that right now we are facing a lot of challenges connected with that kind of disproportion. On one hand, the employees who are expecting from us a lot of support, they are even suffering from the higher level of sick leaves because this is also the comparison, as you can see it here, between the 
to last years that we are having more and more sick leaves, especially connected with the mental disorders. So on one hand, we have employees suffering a lot. On the other hand, we have the boards, the top management, who is just expecting from us results and results. So that's why, in my opinion, we are at some kind of the verge that we don't know, in fact, what to do to make sure that there will be some kind of the alignment between the well-being of the employees and, on the other hand, also, of course, the business results. So if it is about different kind of initiatives that I'm sure that most of you or even all of you, you implement in your companies working in HR, they are, of course, dedicated to those well-being initiatives. So as I can observe it even, uh, it works very often this way that we offer to the employees a lot of mental support because it is becoming more and more popular nowadays to have even separate well-being departments, areas and teams. Uh, and that kind of teams, they're really investing a lot of effort to make sure that employees are going to feel happy, satisfied, comfortable at work. So some of the initiatives are connected with offering quite wide uh, medical packages in which we can offer the employees the access, for example, to their therapy, to psychology, so that this mental health could be managed. We organize a lot of kind of workshops, trainings to increase also the awareness of employees about the necessity to take care of their mental health, which on the same, at the same time is connected with so-called biohacking. And this biohacking, it's also connected again with the awareness, which means that as the employees, as people probably, we are becoming more and more aware that our physical health is very strongly aligned with our mental health. And we are investing a lot into, for example, healthy lifestyle, into skipping so-called sedentary lifestyle. So instead of sitting all the time in front of the computers, which unfortunately is quite typical thinking about the remote work, the hybrid systems. So instead of following the sedentary lifestyle, people are more and more investing into healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, different kinds of sport activities, taking care, for example, of the spine and generally a lot of investment into both physical health and seeing that connection uh, between the physical health and also mental health. And that's also what HR does. I would say that at the beginning, it could be a little bit also difficult or maybe even not natural for us because, well, let's say that work is work. So HR should be also concentrated on different kinds of the processes like recruitment, onboarding and so on. But right now, I would say that we can see very strict fusion between the business life and also this personal life. And it's again connected with those last three years when people were working at home and they were, I would even say, they were working in intermittent system. So a little bit of work, then the break for some private issues, then work, then again break. So it was quite correlated that we we're joining these two aspects of our life. And that's how the HR role is also changing, that we are not only taking care of employees satisfaction from the job, but we have to make sure that they are just going to feel well and comfy at work. But on the other hand, of course, they are also going to be effective. Um, this is for me something also very strongly connected with, again, that second aspect of the business. So with the board and also with the top management, because I can imagine that it can work this way, that we will go to the board and we will even present the current situation in the company. We will say a lot of employees, they are not satisfied. They are not engaged. They are complaining a lot that the workload is too high. So we have to change something in the company to make sure that our employees are going to feel happy. 
but the board is looking at that communication from a different perspective because they will think, okay, HR is coming to us again. They want money from us. They want some kind of investment because they are telling us that the workload is too high. So probably they want us to invest maybe in some massage sessions. They want us to invest in some kind of yoga classes, of course, done during work, which means that right now we have quite low turnover and HR, in fact, is asking us to even still decrease our turnover so there is something wrong and probably from the board point of view it's quite logical that they don't see that kind of the correlation because they have the numbers they have the pnl and it's going to be quite natural that they will treat us hr as the cost so our request to invest in different kind of well-being initiatives can be really treated this way. Okay, this is just the cost and it's not going to have any positive impact on our revenue or the turnover. So I would say that what is really, really important to make sure that we will manage this challenge connected with well-being is to concentrate on something what can be called HR value chain. So to show to the boards to the top management that correlation between our initiatives, even those connected with well-being, and the impact of those initiatives on the results of the whole company. And at the same time, I'm pretty aware it's not so simple because how can we show that if we're going to introduce into the company, let's say these yoga classes, what kind of impact, especially positive impact, it can have on the whole results of the company. I think it's really, really difficult to, to show it. That's why this idea of HR value chain, it shows that kind of the impact, I would say step by step, because it can work this way. First, on a little bit different example, not yet well-being. It can work this way that, let's say the managers are coming to us to HR and saying, well, you know, the truth is that right now, unfortunately, we have, again, quite low results of the company. We have quite low turnover. We cannot produce as many products as we used to do it in the past because we don't have people. So this is your fault, HR, because we don't have results. You're not delivering to us people. So there is something wrong with that. And in that case, what we can do is to show this value chain again, step by step by different kind of metrics indicators, because we can use the first step, which is connected with operational metrics. Oh, sorry, there is a typo here. Of course, I will correct it. We can show different kind of operational metrics, which means that we can show, okay, we are aware that right now we don't have the proper number of the candidates. So we redesigned already the recruitment processes, which means that one of the metrics by which we already check that our process is much more effective is the quality of CVs. So we know that we received lately for one of the positions 50 CVs, quite a lot, but at the same time, because we want to make sure that the whole process is going to be effective, we did a very good search, very good screening, and out of, out of these 50 CVs, because of the redesign, for example, of the uh, job advertisement, because of our concentration on choosing the people who are going to meet our criteria, out of those 50 CVs, we chose 20, which are really of a very good and high quality. So the whole quality, the whole effectiveness of the recruitment process improved. And we are showing that by numbers. In the past, we had, for example, 100 of the CVs. We we're choosing only 10. So it wasn't uh, of a high quality. Right now, we redesigned, for example, the job advertisements. We concentrated more on search, of course. And because of that, we have less CVs, 50. But it's better for us because out of this 50, we are already choosing 20. In the past 10, right now 20, it increased. And probably we could just share that kind of the information with the board. Although I'm not sure if they are going to see still some kind of correlation because, okay, you have 20 CVs, but what does it mean? Nothing. Still, the turnover is quite low. So we have to move a step further which means that at the first glance, 
this quality metrics, these operational metrics, they can be strictly dedicated to us so that we would have the awareness how the whole process works and how it was improved. But if it is about the second step of the metrics, it will work this way that we will have there the impact and the correlation between operational ones and the employees effectiveness metrics which is a little bit probably more beneficial for the board to understand it because we will say okay right now we have these 20 CVs really great candidates really very well chosen culture feed competences perfectly chosen which means that because of the fact that out of this 20 we employed five employees the best one the best candidates were chosen because of that, the retention level, so the number of the employees who were kept in the company is much higher. And probably this is another argument which can work on the board because they will see, OK, we have more people. The situation is quite stable. That's great. Although still, I would say it's not enough because if we really want to show our value to the board, we have to go a step further. So we have to show that not only the retention of the employees is stabilized, not only we have more employees working for longer time period in the company, but because of that, the turnover of the company is rising because we have more people. They are working in a quite stable situation. They are very effective because they know already very well the company, the processes. They are realizing the KPIs. So if we have st stable headcount, because of that, the turnover of the company is rising. And we can do that kind of comparison. In the past, we had this 100 of CVs, only 10 chosen. The quality was so-so. Probably the rotation level was also quite high. A lot of employees, they were leaving the company and the turnover was balancing or it was even dropping. Right now, we implemented a different kind of improvements and we can see quality improved, retention improved, turnover improved. So we have to calculate these three particular steps to show to the board what is the correlation between these metrics. So that's one thing which can be also applied even for the purpose of these well-being initiatives. Of course, that part is much more difficult, I would say, because uh, we are talking about a very soft aspect. So I can really understand that when, again, we are going to go to the board and tell to the board, we want the employees to be happy. That's why let's implement these yoga classes it can seem even ridiculous to the board. But if we're going to do it this way, that we will start introducing different kinds of initiatives, probably for the beginning, the ones which are even not so expensive, somehow to attract the board to our idea. And we will show that, for example, we started organizing on our own as HR, different kind of well-being workshops, informing the employees how they can take care of their health, what they can do, how they can, for example, rest, how they can take care of their health uh, system. We are going to introduce some kind of mental support consultancy because we already have some medical packages and we are just going to expand it a little bit. Or we are going to introduce the workcation probably which, of course, is going to be more expensive, but we can do it step by step. First, some kind of initiatives which are not so costly. And then, of course, step by step, the ones which at the beginning need some kind of investment. And at the same time, if we're going to show not only these operational metrics, but we will show to the board what is the impact on those for, from those uh, well-being workshops, for example, on the level of the sick leaves, which is much better right now because it is dropping on the, for example, drop of short term sick leaves or probably it will be even connected with the increased productivity. Probably then the board will think, OK, maybe at the beginning it wasn't the best idea in our opinion with that, for example, workshops or maybe even with that consultancy. But if we can see that we have less sick leaves, we don't have to invest into the into overtime. We don't have to invest, for example, in some um, work agency delivering as additional employees. We can see that the productivity of the employees is rising, which at the same time means that the productivity of the whole company, the turnover of the company is rising. Okay, let's say that it wasn't that bad idea. 
And probably what we can also do is that we can even calculate human capital return on investment because we can show how much we invested in those different kind of initiatives, what saving was generated thanks to that. And by that, the company, the board will see that for each one slot invested into those initiatives, we have 10 slot of the profit. So probably if we show uh, different kind of initiatives in that way, by numbers, of course, it is going to show to the board that yes, it works much, much better. And on the other hand, I would say that um, we have, of course, all those challenges. And at the same time, in my, again, private and, and subjective opinion, I believe that last three years were to some point beneficial for HR, because I believe that a lot of boards, a lot of top management, they understood the meaning of HR and the necessity to have HR. And here I would say that on one hand, it's of course beneficial. On the other hand, it's also risky. Because on one hand, if we think about the 2021 research done by Deloitte, it was said uh, in terms of the CEOs of the biggest companies that in their opinion, the biggest challenge they are facing right now, it's about talent management. So something strictly connected with HR. If it is also about some external challenges, the same. If it is about the CEOs, the presidents of the biggest companies, they said that the biggest external challenge that they are facing with is lack of skilled employees. So both of these challenges out of different kind of areas, they are strictly connected with HR. And again, uh, if we think about it from that point of view, we can say, OK, it's very beneficial because it means that if they see the challenges connected with people, they can see the impact of HR. Although I would also say that it can be a little bit risky because I can imagine this time that kind of the argumentation from the managers that we don't have talented people. Oh, HR, this is your fault. We don't have enough skilled people employed. Oh, HR, this is your fault because you're responsible for recruitment. You're responsible for the onboarding process. So you are the ones who are not delivering skilled people, who are not making sure that we have also proper career paths. You're the ones who are not making sure that we are going to have very quickly after employment, good and effective employees. And it can be quite, I would say, easy excuse. That's why I will come back just for a moment again to those operational metrics uh, to show how we can use it in a little bit reverse version. Because assuming that we will have this awareness of the board, that the turnover is dropping because of HR, because we didn't deliver people, we don't have the proper onboarding process. In that case, we can also relate to these operational metrics, which at the first glance, they can be not important for the managers because they just care, okay, PNL done, not done, achieved, not achieved. So for them, the argument like quality of the CVs, it's like nothing. It's typical HR. So why they should even care about it? But we can use it, let's say, um, in terms of our defense, because we can say, OK, this is the whole process of recruitment. We have right now 20 very good CVs because we did really very good research. But at the same time, in our operational metrics, we are also measuring the conversion rate. So we are checking what is the effectiveness of each particular step in recruitment. And what we saw is that we are delivering you 20 very good CVs. And due to the fact that usually the managers, they are responding to us within three weeks, in the meantime, we are losing 15 people out of this 20. So finally, after those three weeks, we are only able to invite for the second round on the, of the interview only five people. And this is the argument of the managers that you are also the ones who have to be involved into the HR processes because you received 20 CVs, 
you were waiting for three weeks. So it means that if you want to have really effective employees, if you want to have the employees who are going to stay in the company, if you want to have more people to be able to realize the turnover, please remember it's not only about HR and our role to design properly the HR processes, but it is also your role. So I would say that this is something what, again, can be quite risky, but on the other hand, it's very important to show this correlation, not only HR and impact on the board, but also in the reverse version. And as I said, if it is about those HR challenges, one of them, which is right now mentioned, uh, is the process of talent management. And here, a lot of companies, they are facing a lot of, I would again say, challenges or problems or issues connected with that aspect, which is a bit connected also with the current situation, I would say worldwide, and the job market. Because the unemployment rate in most of the countries is very low. There are a lot of different kind of companies. There are a lot of different kind of career opportunities. People, people can be even overemployed. So they can work, for example, for a few companies. According to the latest labor law changes, we know that right now it's also legal to be overemployed. So to work on employment contract, not only for one company, but for more. So we have many more opportunities with different kind of flexible working opportunities. And because of that, the rotation levels are higher. And if we want to retain, if we want to keep people in the organizations, we really have to offer them a lot because the competition from the point point of view of, of other companies, from the point of view of industry, from the point of view of other countries, and we can work right now remotely, it's really, really high. So this aspect connected with talent management and some um, development possibilities, it's really very important aspect. And that's why I'm quite in favor of the idea related to development talent management opportunities, which I would call spider web career design. Um, I have that kind of a feeling that in the past it was quite typical that when we were talking about promotion, advancement, development, we were rather thinking about typical hierarchical structures and the vertical advancement. So coming to the company, we are probably on some kind of specialist position. And then the possibility of promotion development will mean that either I can become team leader, for example, or manager, or generally I can go up my career ladder. And I would say that it was quite typical for many, many years everywhere to think about career opportunities and career paths in that kind of way, that it's everything what is connected with the managerial path. On the other hand, um, not everybody wants to become manager. And I think that there is also much higher awareness of the employees right now. And very often it happens that if somebody starts working as the specialist, that person will rather choose the expert path because of different reasons. Sometimes it can be connected with their, even with the higher pay offered on the expert path. Sometimes it's connected with the accountability that we know that if we're going to become managers, we will have to take ownership for the processes, for the people, and we don't want it. We have a little bit different priorities. So I would say that also the uh, approach of people changed. And right now, it's not so obvious that if we start work, we have the ambition to become managers because we want to develop in different kind of areas. So that spider web career design is connected with having a look at development from all the possible dimensions. So, of course, it can be connected with different kind of vertical moves, but it can be also connected with lateral development. So I can move not only to the manager's path and position, not only I can become an expert from junior to senior, but I can also choose the rotating path. So maybe right now, let's say I work in HR department and I'm responsible for recruitment. But I can see that probably if it is about becoming senior recruiter, 
Mm, not necessarily. Probably if it is be about becoming recruitment manager, well, maybe also. That's not something for me. So I'm thinking about other possibilities, either in the HR area. So I'm considering maybe from recruitment, I will move to employ employer branding. Maybe it's not even interesting for me, despite the fact that competences are quite similar. And I'm, I'm starting wondering about, for example, compensation and benefit path. It's about, of course, different competences because I have to be more analytical, but I can see that it can be something beneficial for me. So I'm choosing the rotating path, for example, in my area in HR, but this rotating path can be, of, of course, also connected with any different kind of areas because maybe I will work a little bit in that recruitment, in employer branding, maybe I will even move to compensation and benefit, but at some certain point I will decide mm, that's not for me. Generally this HR area, that's not something I'm interested in. So I will go to somebody still in that HR area and tell them, you know, with my competences, with my predispositions, with my preferences, maybe you can choose for me, you can suggest any other rotating path. And probably then, depending on the business needs and possibilities, depending on the competences and preferences, there will be a decision, okay, so if not HR, if not any of those particular positions, maybe you can go, for example, to marketing department, or maybe sales is going to be appropriate for you. So we can choose any other rotating path, which means also still lateral move, but in different areas of the companies. Sometimes, of course, we're not going to have that kind of the possibilities because maybe all the positions are placed, the company is not developing, they don't have any new vacancies, so I don't have that kind of possibilities. And of course, it can happen. So in that case, still we can probably offer something to the employees and maybe we can think about some project path. Because maybe still I can work in HR department and let's say I will stay on the position of recruiter. It's not that bad, so I can do it. But at the same time, the company is right now organizing different kinds of the projects. Those can be the projects connected with my area. So maybe there is a new project connected with implementation of some new HR system, and I can participate in that project. It will be a little bit analytical, and I was thinking about this company ban, so it can be something for me. Or at the same time, the company is organizing a lot of interdisciplinary projects, which are combining people from different areas and different departments. So let's say that right now the company is, impl is implementing some BI solutions, which means that there will be people from different areas, somebody from analysis, probably somebody from maybe controlling, somebody from sales. It can be somebody from HR, from different kind of areas. So still I'm doing the recruitment, but the company is designing for me also some other possibilities and this interdisciplinary path with some combination of projects where I have the possibility to get to know different people and also their skills, competences from those various areas. Maybe it can be also connected with the mobility path. Of course, mobility can be understood also in a very wide way, because on one hand, it can be connected with that spider web, because I can be just mobile and move from one department to another, from one role to another. But probably if we think especially about international companies, those mobility programs, they're going to be connected with moving from one division to another or even moving from one country to another. So if I have also that kind of the possibilities, I can see a variety of dimensions. At the same time, if I said today that it's not so popular anymore to follow this vertical path, uh, I would say it's connected with one of the latest trends and making the organizational structures flatter. Because for many, many years, it worked this way that in most of the countries, I would even say, we had quite tall organizational structures. So probably operational employees, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> probably operational employees, probably people on some higher positions. So like middle managers, top managers, the board, like a lot of levels in the organization. And it was quite popular.
But right now, we can see that kind of the trend moving a little bit from this typical orange organizations to green and teal organizations, we can see that we are making the structures flatter and we are empowering employees. So we're giving them more decisiveness. We're giving them just more power to participate in different kinds of the processes. At, at the same time, we don't have so many levels of management, so we are flattening the structures. So if we were to combine on one hand these flat organizations, on the other hand, this traditional robust approach to designing the career where we have only these vertical possibilities, it would mean there are no development possibilities. That's why we have to redesign our idea of talent management and propose a lot of lateral possibilities, a lot of projects, a lot of work which is going to be connected with having our, for example, traditional even position and profession and just doing something additionally. Which means that one of the aspects which, in my opinion, is really crucial, it will be something what is called multi-level projects. It's connected with the fact that we have these flatter structures and at the same time we're investing a lot into the ownership because flatter structure means this higher level of empowerment and it also means that we want employees even on that operational levels to be more involved engaged to take the decisions but also to uh, bear the accountability so to be aware that they are the ones who are fully responsible for some process for some task and sometimes they are taking the decisions on their own managers being just supportive but not the decisive ones so that's the reason why in my opinion to even teach and educate employees a little bit more to take this ownership we have to create multi-level projects which would mean that we're going to create even this Power BI project, which I mentioned, uh, combining people from different levels. So there will be one person working operationally. There will be probably one team leader. There would be one person from the senior management. They would collaborate on that project, designing, implementing that project together. And by that, those different people, they could, of course, exchange the experiences, the knowledge, the competences, and probably people from these operational levels, they could also observe how team leaders, how senior managers, how they take this ownership for for the organization for the process for that project and because of that they could become more and more independent and of course empowered uh, i can also admit that i really like the idea uh, about which i heard in china which is connected with so-called pnl teams that work, would work this way that if we have, for example, the production company, probably we have several different kind of the products. And normally it could work this way that we would have production department, procurement department, quality and many others, all of them responsible for production of, of all of those products. But if we had so-called PNL teams, it would work this way that we would design those interdisciplinary teams. So there will be people from production, from quality, from procurement, but smaller teams. And each of these teams, they would have assigned certain product to be produced. So there would be, of course, like the production line, but they would be working on that product, like on the projects at the same time being responsible for PNL. So being responsible for making sure that this product is going to be profitable for the company. So on one hand, they would be, of course, having more possibilities of development, but on the other hand, if they would know that they are responsible for PNL, so for profit and loss, they would know, okay, this is our responsibility this is our ownership so we have to really become like the owners of the company responsible for the profit of the project uh, so that's again something what is connected with making the structures flatter investing in people's development and at the same time making sure that they're going to be really involved into the company development uh, probably one more thing which can be connected with that spider web development and career opportunities, uh, they, that will relate to cross trainings. 
which works this way that on the one hand, of course, it's fantastic probably to say that if I right now work in recruitment and I don't feel it, this is just my whim to say that I would like to work in procurement, in sales, in marketing, different departments. But on the other hand, I have no idea how it is to work in that department. I can have my imagination, but in fact, this is just my imagination. So because of that, we can organize something like those cross trainings. It would work this way that, for example, once per month, each of the departments and maybe some assigned people from these departments, they will organize the training in which they are showing how the works looks in that departments. So we could follow something like job shadowing, being able to observe those people at work. It can be also the on the job training. So we can even do we can even execute some typical tasks, of course, under supervision of those people, just to get used and to, sh to see how the work in that department looks. So before we are going to be reassigned to, for example, different departments, first we can just see how it works. We are going to see as employees if that's proper. The managers, they are going to see if we are the suitable people for that particular role. And at the same time, it will be quite safe for the business because we won't just lose the employee from one and also the second department. So I would say that it can be also something very beneficial, the same as job simulation. Job simulation will be also some kind of a pilot which would mean that I already went to that cross training from recruitment to marketing. I saw that, yeah, I kind of like it. I was able to become a shadow of these marketing people. So I was observing what they are doing. I was even like doing some kind of very, very basic tasks. But right now, before the final decision is going to be taken, I can participate in job simulation. So I will be assigned, for example, to this department, let's say for one week, I will start doing the task. So it will be some kind of a pilot. I will see if that's OK. The manager of that department is going to see if that's OK. If yes, probably we can talk further about my possibilities. So something what is going to be beneficial, not only from the point of view of the employees, but also from the point of view of the business and ensuring, of course, safety, security to business. Still, if we talk about these development possibilities, I can imagine that it can happen that it will be difficult both to go up in the career ladder, to find another place in the company. Maybe currently we don't even have any kind of projects and really the person has no, no possibilities to, to move to any different area. So probably in that case, we can think, OK, so what can we do? What can we design within the single role of the person? And probably here we could uh, follow with something what I would call the job enrichment. So we are just going to work on the person who is right now, for example, junior, assigning more and more advanced tasks. We are going to stretch the role, and it is also the formal uh, word in HR, stretching the role, which means that for now we are assigning to the person a little bit more ambitious tasks beyond the capabilities of this person just to show how this person can develop in case of that particular possibility uh, position so we're assigning more tasks more complicated tasks we're assigning to this person more decisiveness to make sure that this person is going to become independent in the position and of course that's also connected with quite famous idea lately in hr like job crafting which also means that within the single role, we can uh, provide a little bit more opportunities connected with showing to the employee that even though this person is only the recruiter, it doesn't mean that there are no possibilities because that person, let's say, will be responsible for one part of the recruitment and that person will be responsible for sourcing. So doing a lot of cold mailing, cold calling, just contacting the potential candidates and at one particular moment that, that person can say, OK, but it's not bringing any value. I'm just all the time calling the candidates. I'm just writing this image. I don't see a point in that. It's really like extremely, first of all, boring. And on the other hand, it's also not bringing any value. But if the manager is going to show the correlation, and going to show, okay, 
you think that you're just writing emails, but have a look. One month ago, when you were writing the emails, the number of the candidates who write, wrote you back, it was, let's say, five people. Right now, I know that you implemented some improvements, you changed something, you redesigned a little bit the message, and I know, and I can see it by the results, that right now around 20 candidates are writing you back. So this is a great effect, and because of that, we have more of these quality CVs, we are following the value chain to show the person the meaning of their role from this operational part to really having this bigger picture. And that's going, going to be the cognitive crafting. At the same time, of course, we can expand still the role even within the team because maybe we can use so-called rotation of tasks. And let's say this recruiter is still coming to us, already sees that meaning. So, okay, I have impact. I know that if I'm going to receive this 20 CVs, yeah, that, that brings the value to the company. But please believe me, it's just boring because I'm all the time just writing these messages, 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 and I'm really tired and fed up with that. So what we can propose knowing that we have the whole recruitment team and there are the people who are responsible for sourcing, but there are also the people who are responsible for creating some kind of the tape templates. They're responsible for doing some kind of the test. They are running the interviews. We can say that some of the tasks, they are going to be the rotating ones. So we will do it this way that, for example, if it is about contacting the candidates for that particular position, one week the that person is doing that. So it will be about this cold calling, call mailing. Next week, another person will do it. And the following week, another person. And because of that, this recruiter, who was at the very beginning quite bored, will be able to get some different kind of the task. So at least something to make sure that the person is not going to feel, I would say, so bored. So that's something what can be also connected, of course, with that career opportunities. And at the same time, if I were to match the development possibilities, the career paths, and of course the engagement and effectiveness of the employees, I would say that we have to have a look at the engagement of the employees from a little bit wider perspective. And I know that in a lot of companies, we are facing that kind of the challenge that when we have people on senior positions, we will at some point feel that this is really the glass ceiling. Everything what was possible for that person to be achieved is achieved. The person is really an expert and master the skills. The person is a mentor for the other people. The person participate in different kind of the projects and still we can see that it's not enough. So I really believe that it might happen that from the point of view of development, there is always some kind of the limit. Maybe I shouldn't say it, but I think it can really come. So if we think about the engagement, we have to be aware that engagement of the employees is not only built on that growth possibilities, development possibilities, but it's also connected with being able to build relations with other people. So, for example, participating in different kind of social charity initiatives. It's connected also with impact and autonomy. So if it works this way, that we have the employee who is already an expert and that that employee is going to be managed by the manager who is quite controlling if once, on one hand, the employee won't, will not have any more possibilities for development, but on the other hand, that employee will be not fully independent, will not have impact on the decisions made in that department. So I would say we'll live very shortly. But even if we're not going to have these possibilities of development, but at the same time, we'll let this person have impact on the process in our department, so even designing these recruitment processes, having impact on taking decisions, being, being fully independent when the manager is simply not going to disturb this person. So when we're going to assign this autonomy and impact, I would say that together with that growth opportunities, together with being able to build different kinds of relations, it should be really sufficient to build the engagement of the employees and at the same time they can just choose what is going to be really sufficient and comfortable for them.
And for the very end, before I'm going to ask you uh, to ask the questions, probably just a few things from the typical vocabulary, also the ones which are connected with that topic I was today mentioning. And I would say that it's quite popular, if it is about HR, to talk right now about reskilling and upskilling. So if I'm a junior recruiter and I want to move up and I want to become a master in my area, I will definitely upskill. I was junior, right now I'm senior. I was upskilling. So in my area, I was developing my skills. But in the meantime, I decided that, that probably this recruiter role, not necessarily. And I was trying to check this marketing and so on. So I have to acquire new skills in different departments that will be connected with reskilling. So I'm applying for different positions, learning the new skills, and that's about reskilling. At the same time, I said that because of the current market, it's quite unfortunately typical right now that a lot of employees, they will be looking for opportunities in other areas, and that can be about job hoppers. So people who, who will quite frequently change the job and move to other companies. But it might happen that if they're going to see that other companies don't offer so much, probably they can become boomerangs. So they can come back to our company. So the person who is going to be rehired, that kind of the person is going to be called boomerang. And maybe somebody who is going to face the situation that Glasslink came, so like all the development possibilities were already achieved, that kind of the person can be called lifer. So the person who is working, who has been working in the company for several years. So some typical words that we can, of course, formally, practically use also in HR. And I believe that if it is about the part connected with combination of well-being, career path, of course, and this typical vocabulary that we can apply in HR, that's everything what I wanted to mention. Of course, if you're going to have any kind of questions, please let me know. And I will be, of course, gladly answering the questions. You can even have the contact here to me. But right now, we've also this few reminding minutes.